So here are some of the big, the big takeaway points that we come to when it, um, when it comes to homework. This was the big one for me, teaching high school Spanish. Um, you know, nobody really ever told me how to do homework. Did that happen with all of you guys too? Like you go through your teacher prep program, there's not like a lesson or a unit or anything on here's how you do homework. And so I got in and I just kind of did what was done to me. Does that sound familiar? We just end up doing what, what's done to us a lot of times. And after doing it for a few years, I kept thinking, this worksheet that I just sent home, these questions that I sent home, 10 questions and the kids come back with a paper that has 10 words on it. It's like the bare minimum, you know? Like what, how little can I do? And I started looking at that and I'm going, how much return do you get on that? Because we spend all of this time, don't we? We spend all of this time assigning it and grading it and arguing about it. And I think how much actual learning comes out of that with all of the time that we, that we spend on it. And that was one of the big questions I had. And so I think we've got to really ask ourselves that question. How much learning comes out of that? And then whenever you factor in the fact that once it goes out of your classroom, you don't really know who's doing the work. You know, the ones, and tell me if this sounds familiar too. I also found that the kids that really, really needed to do the homework, where, yeah, I see the head shaking, you guys know. Those aren't the ones that are doing the homework anyway, right? What about the kids who don't need to do the homework? They do it because it's easy for them, because they've already got it, you know? I think we've really got to take a hard look at that. And so, you know, how much learning actually comes out of that? If the kids that are good at it already are doing more things that they're already good at, the, end, the, you know, the, the boost isn't that much. And the kids that are struggling with it are going to continue to struggle or not do it. And so that's, that's where, that was one of the big things for me anyway. That's where I kept coming down. I have five kids, so I've seen quite a bit of homework come home. And oftentimes it's not the really awesome stuff that you do in class. What I see as a parent is not the time that my kid was reading or my, what my kid's teacher does is she sends a picture of what my kid's doing at school. I think that's one of my favorite things ever. So what I see coming home is not usually critical thinking. It's almost always DOK1. But if we're going to ask kids to be thinkers, we need to support them by giving kids access to their highly qualified teacher. I, I say this quote all the time, but that's actually a mat line. <laughs> Um, kids, when we give kids access to their highly qualified teacher, then we can focus on doing those critical thinking and not sending them home just to struggle. Now, productive struggle is actually very important when we're talking about critical thinking. But that doesn't mean we need to send them home to cry and struggle through it where we can. When I see a kid struggling, I know how much support to give them. But honestly, I'm just not there as a teacher to be with them to know what they need. I remember one time my son comes to me and says, Mom, I need some help with the associative and the commutative property. He's in third grade. Well, I literally have a degree in math, you guys. I'm a math teacher. So I'm like, that's no problem because that's totally what I want to do with my Wednesday night. <laughs> but I'm thinking, what about the other 29 parents who don't know about the associative and the commutative property? And so we spend all this time where I'm doing a full-on lesson at home and then what, how does this end up? With my son rolling on the floor screaming? But that's not how my teacher does it. And so if we want kids to be thinkers, we gotta think, how can we just bump up the critical thinking in class so I don't need to send it home? Do I need to send home DOK1 when we're doing higher critical thinking tasks in class? So one way to ditch that homework is to give some really deep breaths to yourself. How much learning is that? Some? Some learning? Or a lot of learning? If the answer is some, I recommend that you ditch it and work with kids on increasing their critical thinking skills. And we're going to get so much more bang from our buck from developing critical thinkers and going deeper than we will from sending home homework. Here's another one. See, when we got ready to, to write this book, one of, the things that, one of the things that we did was we reached out to lots of teachers, but we also reached out to parents too. And we said, if you want your kids to have homework, what's one, what are the big reasons why? And one of the big ones we kept hearing was, the homework gives us a window into the classroom because whenever we see that homework come home, then we know what's going on in the class. And you know, we saw that and I totally get that. 
but I think it made us sad more than anything because we started to realize that if the graded homework that we send home is our best way of communicating with parents, then we are doing a lousy job. And so the question then becomes, how can we give them, I mean, especially with the younger kids, but even the, with the older kids, you might be surprised at how interested parents are in knowing what's going on. I mean, if you've got kids, you understand what parent hasn't begged for a little bit of insider information to the question, what did you do at school today? And if you can actually engage them in a meaningful conversation about what's going on in school, think about that. Now you're getting the extra reps with your kid because you as the parent is suggesting it. And not necessarily because the teacher is imposing a grade that's go or a, an assignment that's going to be worth a grade. And so this is, this is just more of that stuff where if we do it a little bit smarter and we recruit parents onto our side, we're not even really recruiting them onto our side, if you think about it. We're all on the same side. We all want to see those kids succeed and become the best human beings that they can. And so if we leverage that relationship so that the parents are empowered to do it on their side too, that can be really, really powerful as well. Speaking of parents. So if you look at research, actually one of the most impactful things that we can do to make learning sticky is reflection is reflection. But we usually run out of time to do the reflection process, but that's really an important part of the learning process. So I would like to suggest that you create a parent corner. So what you're going to do is, I, I suggest no matter what you're doing, digital or not, and I love paper by the way, you should use lots of paper, but I would still mention it in some sort of digital format. So whatever we did all day long, because I have five kids and I say, how was school today? And they say, good. And I say, what did you do? And they say, recess. I know you're laughing, but it's true. So instead I say, pull up your Google Classroom or whatever digital format that your teacher puts it in and let's look at what you did together and let's review it together. Here's the problem is that most of the stuff we post, the audience is the student. And so what do you do is you get parents emailing you questions because they don't understand what you've posted online because the audience was the student. So what I want you to do is after you put the student directions, I want you to push enter a couple of times and I want you to write parent corner, parent corner. And I want you to write one to three sentences where the audience is the parent. One to three sentences where you explain why you're doing this. Now I've been guilty of this. You're working on your, something with your kid and you don't quite get what it is and you just accidentally say, well, this is stupid, <laughs> right? They don't mean to um, not support you, but they're frustrated. They don't understand what the point is. So if you write one to three sentences where you're like, we're doing this because not only am I going to avoid that, well, this is stupid, but I'm going to avoid having them email me. If I can save one parent from email, and by the way, if they want to email me because their kid is struggling and we need to come up with a plan, the answer to that is yes. If you want me to read the agenda to you because you didn't ask your kid, the answer is no. So I'm going to write one to three sentences where the audience is the parent, and then I'm going to write one to three reflection questions that do not require an answer key. This, they will literally get more learning out of reflecting with their parent than they will out of doing some sort of review practice because there's the law of diminishing returns that says when your brain's tired you actually need a rest. So this is why homework isn't that effective. It's not that practice isn't effective, it's that they, they will get more of resting and doing some reflection. So if we're talking about learning, sitting down with your parent, now we're sending home conversations instead of sending home rolling on the floor. And the thing I love about that too is that with these reflection questions, they don't, we don't need to send questions home that need an answer key because we're not grading them, you know? The parents aren't grading them. We just want to get that discussion. We want to hear how the kid kind of thinks through it. And as a parent, that's something that we can do, which I really, really like. How can you create an experience? So if you were at the opening keynote um, on Monday, then David Eagleman talked a little bit about this, about how the emotional experience that's tied to learning makes learning sticky. And if you think about how forgettable school is so much, I mean, like, think about that inspirational worksheet that you had when you were a student. I'll give you a second to think about it, because it's hard, you know? But 
how can we create an experience? This is one of my favorite quotes from Dave Burgess's book, Teach Like a Pirate. He says, don't just teach a lesson, create an experience, right? And that doesn't mean that you have to like deck out your room and put on costumes and do wild outlandish things every single day. You can do that stuff and that totally creates an experience. But even just little things about how can we create an experience. One of the big things I'm, I'm on right now is how can we create the experience of the apps that kids love with tools that they're already using. I've seen teachers use really, really creative uses of Google Slides to recreate some of the social media platforms. Like I've got one that I'm going to present on tomorrow about doing Instagram stories with Google Slides. If kids are all about Instagram and making Instagram stories, if they can record videos that show their understanding in that frame, now we've created an experience that's memorable. And now all of a sudden that learning, you ever had this happen before? The kids walk out the door at the end of the, a class and you're like, they're not gonna remember a word I just said. I'm gonna have to do all of that over. It's like it's gonna go leaking out their ears over the next 20 minutes, you know? I think this is the kind of stuff that makes it sticky. And of course, if we do this, if we're able to do this in class, if it becomes memorable, how much do we really need to send that worksheet home at home? That's one of those things where I think we can teach smarter instead of harder, and we can get just as much, if not more, out of it. Spiraling. I'm gonna kick this over to Alice in a second, but this is, this is one of those things that's been around for a while, um, where if we can pull things up that we've done from before. You know, brain research tells us that you can't study for long-term learning in short bursts. You have to forget it and then be able to remember it. And one of the ways that I love to do that is whenever you create Quizlet flashcards. You're all familiar with Quizlet flashcards? I mean, Quizlet's been around forever, like online flashcards. So you make a deck of Quizlet flashcards for your lesson. But then you also take that and you can combine your Quizlet sets into a master list. So give your kids some time to practice with that one list for that one lesson, but also give them some time to practice the master list where they're continuously pulling in things throughout the year because that's the way your brain wants to learn. It wants to be able to forget it and then try to remember it again. So Joe Bowler is a Stanford math professor and what she says is ineffective to do 30 problems at once, cramming it all in and doing your practice all at once. Well, what percentage of the adult population has number sense? The answer is nine. If doing 30 problems for homework worked, we'd all be math rocket scientists. But we know, and I tell people I'm a math teacher, they literally will pull back and cringe like they were abused as children, and some people will refuse to keep talking to me. We are not inspiring a love of learning by cramming it all in. It's better is the spaced repetition. It is better to do three problems that cause, that force you to think how does it apply the pattern, not how is it exactly like what I just showed you, and then to do two problems where you're revisiting something you've done in the past. 